This is a Touchstone Publishers presentation, your trusted source of leadership knowledge. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. So my name is Glenn Daniels and solo just for a moment, we had a uh, technical issue and had to change our link for our live broadcast. We wanted to get it started though. And in the process of contacting our guests, which I really, really want you to be here for her. We'll get her on as soon as she's able to get the uh, link and get signed in with us. But in the meantime, I'll just give you a little bit of a hint as to what we're going to work on if she doesn't come. But you guys, you really want to stick around and give her a chance to get here. Uh, Dr. Uh, says not Dr. But uh, Miss Bruner is somebody that we want to spend some inf some time with because when it comes to leadership information, we need to make sure that we have our abilities, our place, our way to help our children become better. We need to find ways to make sure we're a little more balanced in what we do things and how we train. She's going to point out some wonderful things about what STEM really is, how it's underfunded and how it hurts us. And she also has some um, standards that uh, she can help bring us to so we can even the playing field. Some wonderful, wonderful thoughts that she's shared. Natalie Robinson is her name. We're going to get to that. But in the meantime, while we wait for her to get to the uh, new link, and it's not her fault, um, not my fault. It's technology as well, I guess. I don't know who to blame for this one. But uh, the stream we had set up for her originally would not start. Uh, we had to go to a whole new stream to get everything working. So she should be here shortly. In the meantime, let me explain to you in case she's not here and we have to reschedule. We'll take this opportunity to talk to you about this set of podcasts that we're doing with TEDx or TED Talk speakers. Now, when I first started this, I started with the idea of let's get subject matter experts on board and we still do that that's just in the essential leadership skills the podcast in fact we're, we're taping one later today uh, that gets up there and we can talk about the one talk about certain leadership skills the one we're taping later today by the way is on martial arts and how you apply that the principles behind martial arts into your everyday leadership abilities that's essential leadership skills the podcast but this is a discussion with TEDx or TED Talk speakers. It'll be a separate playlist that you can look at. I think right now we have about 25 in there. Um, but we have just separate playlists from TED Talks, TEDx speakers to share their wealth, their knowledge, everything they have, why they did this. One of the things we talk about right away is why did they do this? What was that journey like? You know, if you have ever done a TEDx or TED Talk, you have to have a ton of passion for it. You have to have just so much passion. It just becomes unbelievable because uh, when I first got coached on this, the gentleman said, just make sure you have one wall so you can just print off all your rejection notices and put them up and you'll cover the entire wall. We didn't quite take the entire wall, but it did take quite a few no's before you get a yes. On occasion, though, you run into speakers who are asked to go speak there. And they are stam stammied by the ideal of what I want to talk about is 45 minutes, an hour and a half long. How do I get it down to under 18 minutes? Miss Robinson had to get hers down to under eight minutes. How do you do that? You have to have a passion. You have to be able to work really hard. You got to make things happen. This series, I think you'll find will be exciting and innovative and is just absolutely wonderful. So. I do apologize, she's not quite here yet. Um, we'll give it just a couple more minutes. Uh, if anybody's listening and have any questions, we'd be more than happy to answer those questions for you. Okay, here's the question right now. Let me read it real quick. Okay, yes, we do have our YouTube channel. It's Essential Leadership Skills. We do have uh, three or four playlists inside of that. We invite you to go ahead and let us build this. The ideal Touchstone Publishers is a publishing company that publishes workbooks, textbooks, and now we're going to publish online magazines, and this magazine is designed for leaders. 
So we're going to have three or four different streams of information inside of this consistently. Okay, we're going to curate a lot of information. So if you're a writer and you're interested in writing and you want to get your stuff put out there, contact us. We'll be happy to talk to you about it and see you know, if it fits the concept of what we're doing. What we're really working with is leaders who are out there making a difference, who are striving to make what I call a generational difference. In other words, the work you do will go to that person's children, that person's grandchildren, and maybe even their great-grandchildren. The work you do must last for generations. Not just that person right there for a half an hour or for one year. It must make a difference for generations. So if that's the type of work you're wanting to create and put out there, we can make that happen. Make that absolutely happen. I think it would be absolutely great if we could make something like that happen. If you want to write for us, that'd be so perfect. That would be so perfect. Um, if you're a subject matter expert on leadership skills, like, for example, time management, we have one of those coming on pretty soon. If you have uh, leadership skills and accountability or anything like that, we highly recommend that you contact us. Okay. If you're a TEDx speaker, a TED Talk speaker, you are more, more than welcome to um, join us. So I'm going to apologize so she hears us. Okay, so we started on time, but not my fault this time. <laughs> not your fault for sure. But for some reason, the stream we originally picked to go with you with wasn't coming on. So we had to make an emergency change. But now that you're here, I want to... Uh, let everybody know you a little bit so we're going to just pretend like we're just getting started okay oh by the way good morning to you as well but let's go ahead and just get us all underway here welcome to essential leadership skills a discussion with tedx speakers please join us today as we welcome natalie robinson she is passionate about serving and educating the community through poverty alleviation and youth development the division director of racial and gender equity advancement at YWCA South Florida, Natalie oversees all functional operations and program management of the organization's community and women's programming focused on economic development, global education and social justice leading to racial and gender equity. Through her work, she directly impacts about 350 kids and 1,500 economic empowerment participants throughout Miami to ensure their interactions with YWCA South Florida positively shapes their future. She has led the family wellness programs where she supported the breast and cervical cancer education and screening for over 1,400 women. This is a Touchstone Publishers presentation, your trusted source of leadership knowledge. Well, okay, again, so just so that you're aware of it, I always say good morning no matter what time of day it is because it's always good morning someplace. So I thank you very much, and I really greatly appreciate your patience. I put you through the ringer here the past couple of times. So I greatly appreciate your patience. In that brief introduction, and it was brief because your credentials are absolutely powerful and heart-shaping, I think. And I think that we have a lot to cover, so I want to just jump into it, but I want to just stay right where we get started at. I would like for you to tell us and share with us what is unique, powerful about either you or your TEDx or your organization. What's unique and powerful that maybe the listener needs to know that maybe they're not quite aware of? So I think the, the biggest thing that's unique and powerful is that this comes from a, a sincerity of heart a lot of the, the work that I do. Um, you know, my TEDx was born from the fact of um, just when I was in high school, you know, I had a high school counselor who told me that basically, you know, don't apply to Harvard because you're not going to get in. And so mm. when you have those, yeah, experiences as a young kid, you know, a counselor is someone you trust and you believe, you know, their words when they say something to you, um, it, it, it drives your future but you're too young to, to recognize that maybe that's not the best driver of your future. Yes, and yeah. so um, as I sort of started doing work with, um, you know, my company throughout my career um, and the, the TEDx is really sort of grounded that, you know, we need to pour more experiences into people. We need to better shape the way that they can see how their future looks like. And just to, to understand that there's a better path out there. Um, you can do more than you ever thought. Um, don't let anyone sort of tell you that you aren't capable. You have so much in you that you don't even understand. And, you know, maybe sometimes the world may not see it, 
they may not value it, but it's there and we need it. And so that's really where the yeah. this TEDx, uh, this TEDx talk came from. And it's a powerful TEDx, and I want to get into that. But in some ways, you started this journey to the TEDx back in high school, and then said, yeah. don't apply to Harvard. But when you actually conceived with the idea to say, okay, I'm going to do a TEDx, from that moment to the time you walked up on stage, can you tell us about that journey? That's a real journey. And I think you know that <laughs> a little bit. And so um, it, it really started with a, an idea of like, yes. man, we just need to help each other out to get to the next phase and understand that this is a, a journey, but we all have our part to play in it. And so um, I just kind of started off with an idea and submitted it to the, the TEDx organization in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, from there, we met on a weekly basis to really flesh out what does that mean? How do we impact people? Um, how do we sort of empower people to understand their role and making sure that that comes to fruition? Uh, from there, it was, you know, practice, 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 <laughs> continue yes, practice, yes. and then some more practice <laughs> when it came to being on the stage. But it was really about thinking, okay, how can I take this moment to really help us as a society move forward? How can I take this and understand that this is going to be something that's going to help individuals for, for years to come? It's still up there. Someone just posted it very recently, like last year, um, in association with the article in Canada, because um, it was a moment in time that I knew was going to continually have an impact on, on future events. And so it was more um, needed even more now than I even understood at the time. Well, yeah, I would agree with that. And that's the insanity of the exclusion in STEM. And then I also have on the bottom, for those of you who can see it, the actual TEDx talk link. Um, this is one that everybody needs to get to. They really do. Um, I want to ask you, though, just from the TEDx portion of this, what was it like to take this powerful ideal and narrow it down? You have to do it in under seven minutes, it looks like, or under eight minutes. What was it possible? How did you do that? Um, so they basically, uh, it was a lot of mentoring. So we had a lot of mentors, a lot of coaches that said, you know, is this really what you're trying to say? Let's get it to the heart of what you're, you're really trying to get across. Um, it was, I'm, it was scary. Like going out there and trying to, trying to figure out exactly how do I get all of my ideas sort of narrowed down and hit on exactly what I'm trying to, to get at. And so it was really about a lot of, um, idea development. Like, what am I trying to do? A lot of digging into the why. What do you mean? Why? What do you mean? Should we get down to the real core of it? And then once you get to the core of it, that's really what it extends out of. So let's just focus on the core. I know there's a lot we can talk about. And we talk about STEM and, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion in STEM. We can talk, like, on so many different levels. And I tried to hit on all the points, you know, <laughs> from preparation yeah. to the environment um, that individuals are going to in the STEM field. Like, there's a lot of different aspects that you can really talk about but let's get to the core and let's get to the core so that you can say it in a compelling way um a lot of it has to do with storytelling so let's talk about why is this important what situations sort of help bring to light of this importance of this idea and then let's just sort of let's focus on the core because seven minutes is not a long time and oh no to this, deep, this deep topic like you can talk for a while about it I want to also, just for those folks who are thinking about doing a TEDx talk, I want to let you know there's a bit of a difference here in what normally happens and what happened for Ms. Robinson. Mm -hmm. Most times, you have to have that talk done. You don't get coaching. You don't get help. You have to have that done before they accept you. So if you don't have her credentials, you're not going to get there unless you have it done. Unless you have it done. I want to go to a core question. Okay. What is STEM? So that that's a, a good question. Um, and so just off of the, the acronym alone, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, from there, people have added, you know, healthcare, so STEM H. Um, they've yeah. added art, so it's STEAM. And so it's really uh, utilizing a, a scientific method to, to formulate ideas. And most of those fields do that in some form or another. And so it's really looking at those core subjects uh, because they're so closely tied together. Um, you kind of have to be able to understand math, be physics, you know, all yeah, these things yeah. that they are really interrelated with one another. And so because they're built off of one another and sort of use each other to sort of be able to advance their knowledge, uh, they're really tied closely together. 
You know, I found it interesting that the story you told about your friend, um, something, maybe you have it wrong, but your friend, your freshman year in college who didn't make it, and they asked him to step out. That story you told, that was compelling. And I think that's where I finally understood the title, The Insanity of Exclusion in STEM. Can you kind of share that story again and how that affected you coming, creating that title? Because once I really heard the story, it connected with me, but would you share that with the audience? Sure. Um, so uh, I use the name James. That's not his actual name. But No, uh, it's Jim. His actual name is Jim, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, James, we, we started, uh, you know, college together. Uh, we were taking a lot of the, the same classes. Um, so we were studying at late night together. And so we were like on par, like really working together. Um, but at the end of the semester, you know, I had the grades continue on and he didn't. And I had to stop and think like, what was happening? Like, we're, we're here studying together. Like we're doing the work together. You know, he's explaining things to me. I'm explaining things to him. You know, and so I feel like we're both getting this material to be able to continue on. And then you get the end of the semester and that's not the reality. And I had to stop and think what is happening that I was able to continue on and he wasn't. And um, it, it really rocked my world. It really hurt that someone that I was that close to wasn't able to continue on. And um, he never did uh, graduate from college. Uh, but I had to look and say, what about our, our backgrounds, our sort of our preparation for this time to start off in our STEM degrees were not the same that um, that I was able to continue on and he wasn't. And I had to look at, you know, the, the high schools we went to. You know, I went to um, a private high school where my um, vice principal took me on a college tour. My father was an alum of the university. Um, his parents had not graduated college. You know, he had not been to the university before he started classes there. You know, he didn't take AP classes. You know, I took a number of AP classes in science before I even got to the university. Um, you know, just the, the basic things that, you know, they tell students that they need to do in preparation for a STEM degree, I had under my belt. And I don't know if anybody ever told him that that's what he needed to be successful. And because of that, he didn't have the preparation um, to be able to be successful within the university. And it, it really, it really, it hurts. It hurts to see somebody that you know has the potential, yeah. you know understands the material, but there's just so many other things that are not helping him be successful. And um, he's not the only one. If it were like a one-off story, that would be, um, you know, okay, let's help that individual. But this is a pattern. You see it in the statistics and the data of how a lot of underrepresented students are not finishing their STEM degrees. They are switching to other majors. They are dropping out of school. Um, we're not getting that that difference of background and thought into the field to be able to solve a lot of the real world problems that we are seeing. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. That is right under the healthcare right. stem role. Yeah. Like, why? Look who came up with the vaccine. We need this diversity of ideas in exactly. the field in order to be successful. And people aren't getting it. And that's why I'm saying it's insanity. Like, did we not just? See that when we have the um the vaccine, the the young lady, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, that, that came up with the vaccine for for, for Pfizer, COVID. right? Yeah. 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 Like why are we not seeing that? It's, it's kind of bizarre by all means, but I want to dive because I want to ask you that, but I don't want to lose track of something. Mm -hmm. You were talking about this ideal of these high schoolers not even have been on a college campus before. Yeah. They actually go there. I started thinking, you know, well, the college that I enrolled with, if I hadn't, my brother was up there, if I hadn't gotten up there two or three times, if I hadn't taken a summer class up there, what would that college be like? And I realized, okay, but look at my high school. How many people from that high school actually went to that campus? How much do you think just the college visit makes a difference? You know, it, it really does open up your, your eyes. And I took a, a group of high school kids to a college campus before COVID. Um, to tour, and they had no clue, like, what it meant to be a college student. They knew you took classes, right? But right. there's a lot that goes on around classes. You have to manage your own schedule. Um, there's, you know, gym, food, classmates, uh, sort of study groups, libraries. There's a lot going on, and it's exciting. I mean, it, it was an exciting time in life. 
a lot of new things, a lot of new adventures, and it really motivates you. And I think that's what it, it, it does that a lot of teams don't necessarily get that they need to get is that, hey, this is going to be an exciting time. Yes, it's hard to study and to get into the material and to learn it. But as hard as it is, it's as fun as it is. And so to have that as a motivation um, by going there, by seeing it, you know, seeing is believing to some extent. And I can right. tell you as much as I want to about these experiences and the things that I've had. But for you to go there and to see it yourself, um, I had one kid who just fell in love with the dorm, right? He never seen a dorm before. <laughs> <Are> you <laughs> And that alone, oh, yeah. like, sold them. And, you know, whatever it is for kids to, to sell them on understanding that, you know, college is an option. It can help you. Um, it's a level of growth that's not just academic. I think we get caught on that a lot, that, oh, you're learning, yes, you're learning material, but you're building relationships, you're understanding how to, to move within your field, um, you're making connections. There's a lot that goes on on a college campus that you don't really understand until you go there and you actually see it. I think you have to actually see it. And then the next part that I wanted to pull apart that you were talking about there was the AP classes, the extra work to get ready for college. Reading, writing, and mathematics is not the work you need to get ready for most of these universities. If you don't have that, maybe you should look at a community college, maybe. What do you think about that as a potential solution? Look at a community college first. If you don't, if your high school just doesn't offer that, and I want to talk about why your high school may not offer that, but let's. What do you think about that as a possible? Well, yeah. And then I have another question too. But <laughs> so you see, I'm, I've got lots of questions for you, and actually, we have a couple of questions already for you. So go ahead. So. Okay, so um, I have like a love hate relationship with with that concept. So okay. yes, I love it as an opportunity for those that did not have a preparation in high school to be able to make that, that sort of stepping stone into the university, to be able to get into up to the level of rigor where they can perform and do well. Um, what I'm not a fan of is that that transition from that community college to university is not strong. And so the level of support that students need to, to move from the, the community college level to the university level, um, for whatever reason, is not there. And some mm. universities are help support uh, community college, those that are coming out of the two-year institutions, and some don't. Um, but there needs to be some sort of standardized way that we support students that come from the, the community college level into the university. And so that's why there's this love-hate. Like, yes, I love that it gives the opportunity, but I don't love that a lot of students that do go that path don't necessarily continue on and are as successful, especially in the STEM field. Um, I don't know the data in the other fields. But I'm talking about just for STEM and what I've yeah, yeah, um, yeah, moving yeah. up into their higher level uh, education courses. Because what happens is they then have to go back and take some courses that they've already taken um, because they need sort of that refresher, um, that level of rigor again that still needs to be gotten up to the university level before they can get into their upper uh, level. Ah, classes. okay, okay. Now, I, see, I can understand that because I was thinking about my university in the urban, in Denver itself, I mean, the main campus is up in Boulder, but in Denver itself, it has a community college that is on the same campus. Mm -hmm. And so they actually oftentimes share classes back and forth, you know, if you got so. And that, that's a great way to, to support students to get them up to that, that level of rigor. That, that'd help do that. So uh, one question came in, um, are there programs, Jeff wants to know, are there programs that uh, will allow, do you have something like this will allow people to volunteer to say, okay, let me give you a tour of this campus. So I think maybe Jeff is asking, so if I want to give a tour of this particular campus, are there programs that would allow me to go to that high school and say, okay, let's all meet here. I'll take you on a tour. So um, the the volunteer level, uh, probably on the high school. So if you like reach out to your local high school, say I want to take kids to a college campus, um, some high schools may be open to that. Um, I would also reach out to community-based organizations that deal with teens. Um, they'd probably be really sort of uh, up to that challenge of saying, okay, we have a volunteer that wants to take kids to their alma mater. Um, a lot of universities have tours. Like they have a system for you to go and take tours. And so there's a way for you to go and take tours on these campuses. But mm -hmm. if you don't know to go take a tour of the campus, yeah, you, that's you where the, the breakdown yeah. comes in a yeah, little yeah. bit. And, you know, I'm in Miami. We got like about seven universities all around. And even there, you know, kids live down the street from the university have never been on the college's campus. And so yeah. it's about um, that knowledge of that's an important 
part of your development, your growth, your education, that if your parents went to school, then they know that. But if right. they didn't, then they don't know that that's critical in you getting ready for college. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I agree with that. I was just thinking, like, that's probably the case here in Denver, but I know it's the case in USC. I mean, they got, USC is urban school. Yeah. And the surrounding neighbors, are, I bet 95% of those have never even been on the campus to walk into the library. Mm-hmm. I mean, so that's that's a good point. So as a volunteer, and also this is I was going to talk to you about this later, but it also brings up this the trickle down of knowledge that you were talking about in your TEDx. You mentioned, okay, the people on the job should be talking to the people in the college. The college people should be talking to the people. You no, know, just trickling down the knowledge. Here's what you need to be successful on the job. Here's what you need to be. So can you go into that a little bit more for us and explain your thinking on that? Yeah, so um, that really came from uh, my work when I was at the, the School of Medicine and creating a, a pipeline system. And so a lot of times sort of watch the drop off. So, you know, people are switching out as a major, they're dropping out of college, they're not getting their, their graduate degrees. Once they get their graduate degrees, they're not going into the field. So I, I studied a lot of the drop offs, right? Um, yeah. And as I was studying the, the drop offs at these different levels, um, I was like, well, if they're dropping off at these different levels, that means the person who's made it. Um, really should go back and try and help these individuals that are dropping off to understand, like, why not to drop off? Why we need you in this field? Why to persist? Um, you know, it's not going to be easy. I don't think anything in life is really easy. But um, mm-hmm. just to, to continue on. And so, you know, people that are in the field, like, you got to go back to the colleges and say, hey, you know that this is a, a chilly environment that sometimes you're not going to always be accepted. Um, but we are considered trailblazers. And so to be able to go out there and to really um, move forward in trying to to get you to go into the field, to get your thoughts around these problems that we're solving, um, to continue on and actually stay in the field once you get your degree. Um, those right. in college, um, hey, go back to high school and say, hey, you know, I know that once you get here, it might be a little lonely if you moved away from home uh, just mm-hmm, for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you're going to have to study probably a little bit more than your friends that may have other majors. But if you continue on and get this degree, you have a lot more opportunities than you even begin to realize. You know, high schoolers, tell middle schoolers, hey, ninth grade is important. Like, you can't slip up. You need that GPA to be able to apply to get into the university. You got to take these classes, honors, AP, as soon as you start getting in there, thinking about what path you're going to take through high school. Um, it's not a game. And um, if you've gone through STEM, you know that. Um, if you haven't, you're like, okay, I want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer. You know, I want to be a computer scientist. But I'm not sure quite how to do that. So I just put it onto college. But, you know, college is a part of the path. You need to start prepping for that path early on. And I don't think that uh, message is sort of sent to younger kids that, you know, you got you to gotta start a little earlier than you may want to. So it's not really only knowledge is knowledge and experience that needs to come down from all the way down from the top of the company all the way down through high schoolers to ninth graders freshmen i think that's a wonderful concept another question came in and i was going to ask you this anyway why why is this happening oh <laughs> and I'm, let's kind of be honest about it let's not pull too many punches here why is okay. it happening to minority and the lower served communities why don't yeah. we have that so i mean it, it's a historical thing you know um people of color women poor people weren't allowed in universities uh couldn't afford universities uh whatever reason they were held away from this level of education uh, we have hbcus for the mere fact that they wouldn't let, yeah, like, wouldn't let them in. yeah into into university so we had to have our own university um mm-hmm. and when people are kept out of a whole base of knowledge for for centuries in all reality not only just knowledge but freedom the ability to read like a lot of things were kept and now we're trying to say okay now these barriers are quote unquote supposedly down but a lot of the mindsets haven't necessarily escaped of capability of access of who belongs um Who's value? And so a lot of those things that should be changing haven't necessarily changed for everybody. And because of that, um, it has created an environment where people of color have to push harder, show that they have more value, have to sort of get in there and really 
perform at a higher level just to be able to, to stay. And then even then, like the environment is not welcoming, you know, you're not invited to the 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 company, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, get yeah, together, yeah. you know, yeah, you're yeah. not asked to, to, to leave this project, even if you have the best ideas and you've shown yourself and proven yourself on different projects. And so it's just a lot of devaluing and uh, just not accepting people of color to have a value and a place within um, the field. You know, it seems a shame that we have to remind people that women matter, people of color matter. Um, it's, it's a shame, and but that's the way it is. I uh, was speaking with um, I, one of my good friends, uh, mentor, actually. We were talking about your TEDx, and I told him we were going to do this, and he listened to it. And he said, though, and he wanted me to ask you this. He said, you know, find out if she thinks it's also a funding issue. Inner city schools, urban schools do not get the same amount of money as other schools. And that's his um, his thought. He said, I mean, and it's based, at least here in Colorado, the schools are based upon the property taxes. Mm-hmm. So the inner city schools, they don't get as much revenue because the property tax is not high because the property is not valued as high. Uh, do you see that as part of the problem, uh, the underfunded of, underfunding of this whole thing? Yeah, and so, um, and I even talk about that, about them not having the AP class. And so to have an AP class, you have to have an AP teacher. <laughs> right, right, AP right, teacher. right, 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 right. You got right. money to pay an AP teacher because they get paid a little bit more for t- teaching that level of, of rigor. And yeah. so if you don't have the money to pay an AP teacher, um, if you don't have the money to, to create the environment where the AP teacher wants to go, uh, the, the, for STEM, a lot of supplies that come into it, like AP bio, like the amount of things you need to order and dissect. Um, just to be able to to get through that particular class. Some schools have it and some don't. And so, yes, it's definitely a a funding issue uh, where we see that, you know, just the the school, like when you walk into a school, you can sort of feel like what's happening. Every school has its own feeling when you walk into it. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you walk into your school and it has a feeling of, you know, security, where the maintenance isn't up to par because they have to spend it on something else, um, where there are a lot of other issues that the school has to deal with just to get students to the bare minimum, as opposed to thinking about how can I help these students excel, um, because that's where their money is going. Like, you don't have the, the resources available to help those that have the potential, that have the capability to get as far as they can go. Yeah, see, and, and that, so Robert was right, that is a big, huge issue. Because um, if it's not, if the fund is not there, it's, it becomes a, a huge problem. You mentioned in your TEDx, and I want you to just lay it out for us. What is the solution? So it's that's a so what I mentioned in TEDx is that that pipeline, that shoring up of the pipeline, and so us sort of reaching back to help those um, sort of at the lower under us to to be encouraged to understand the challenges of how to navigate to to get through it. Um, I actually put together a program. Um, called, uh, you know, STEM Start with the, the University of New Mexico, where we actually had um, university freshmen sort of have mentors that were um, in the field. And so they were professionals in um, one of the local labs. And so they came back and mentored the freshmen to help them to understand that, hey, you know, I had a lot of challenges, you know, you know, I had to deal with my parents and had to deal with, you know, some financial issues. Like there were a lot of things that were going on that I had to manage. It's just part of the college experience sometimes. Um, but I persisted through and I got to this point. And so it wasn't easy. But if you persist through, if you understand that, you know, there's an end goal that you're going to have hardships, that it's not exclusive to just you, but it's something that you can get through, um, they were able to do it. Now, they also came back and tutored them in math to make yeah. sure that they were up to par. So it uh, wasn't just all, you know, hugs and kisses. It's like, let's make sure that you are academically yeah. ready to, to move on. Yeah. You, have, you have the hard skills to move on. <laughs> there's, there's the hard yeah. skills that you need to be successful. And so they came back and did that as well. And so we actually had about a 20% um, higher uh, sort of continuation, matriculation of students through the their um, freshman year. So they went on into the sophomore year in STEM more than the average. Um, that students. is a tremendous improvement. It is. That but is... we looked at, again, it has to be wow. comprehensive. It's not just 
gives them math. It's not just meant for them. It's like you got to do a couple different things to make sure your kids are successful at that particular level. Wow, that is tremendous. Uh, uh, after, you have to pat yourself on the back. Yeah, I mean, that was a tremendous program that you put together to do a 20% improvement upon the matriculation rate. That's tremendous as it could be. From that high note, I got to take you to a, a lower note. <laughs> um, I like what you said. So it's not all loss, but let's, <laughs> we're going to go back to the loss situation here. Tell us about your thoughts about this insanity of standards. Yeah, so it's the, and, I guess the, go ahead. I was just was saying before you start that, I mean, everybody thinks we need to have standards and everybody needs to be at the same standards. But you're saying that's insane. Tell us about that. So what, what standards do is it, um, and I'm not against standards. I'm just saying that when you have standards in place, what you're saying is that there is a level that you want um, capability, thought, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means you're excluding some people from that um, because you're saying they don't meet this minimum level. And when you're excluding the, a group of people, that means you're excluding their, their thought process, their, their way of thinking, their ideas. And everyone does have value to add to the solution of a problem even if it gives you a different way to think about it, um, they have some value of adding to us figuring out how to, how to get to these problems. And when we have these standards, and I'm not saying that let's do away with them, but let's really rethink, like, why are they there? How are they gonna help us? How do we make sure that we include people that these standards quote unquote exclude by having them? Um, how do we make sure that that level of thought is sort of added to the process and Yes, I get that there needs to be some sort of um, way to determine, like, if you got 20 slots, how do you give away the, the 20 slots? And I understand that it's going to be hard to figure out, but to, to not understand that people have value, even if they don't, quote, unquote, meet their standards, is what I don't understand. Like, they should be part of the mm -hmm. conversation. They should be part of the thought process. They should be part of us figuring out how do we move forward, because... In reality, like we all as a society have to move forward. And so you may want to exclude people from the thought process, but they are going to be part of either having the solution acted upon them or like even with the pandemic, everybody has to be part of us taking the vaccine to move forward. So move if you forward. weren't um, yeah. utilizing like different thought processes yes. on how do you get the vaccine out or what the vaccine looks like, like you weren't able going to help us to move forward as a society. And so love standards, hate standards, but don't use that as sort of the, the measuring stick end all be all for us moving forward. You know, that's a good example, good analogy you just drew there with the pandemic, the vaccination. We say that everybody should be vaccinated. That should be the standard, okay? But actually we say 70 to 8%, that should be the standard, okay? However, how can we expect Native American tribes who are not, who do not get access to that, to live up to that standard. Mm -hmm. We can't. So I'm asking the same thing when it comes to schools. How do you expect urban schools to have the same level of standards for graduation and for entering college that the other schools, suburban schools have because they have better equipment, better teachers, more STEM classes, more AP classes mm -hmm. uh, than the urban school. If you want standards, and that's what I felt you were saying, so I'm asking you to just kind of coach me on this because I'm, I thought you were kind of also saying, if you want standards, bring up the standards for the other folks too to match. And so, yeah, so the standards often think about the, the end of uh, achievement, right? Of what they're, they're capable of. Yeah, that's but exactly what But we don't what often think yeah. about the, the beginning part of the opportunity that people have. And so we want to talk about this achievement, but you haven't talked about the beginning, like, are we all starting off on the same playing level field? Um, do we all have the same access? Do we all have books in our home growing up? Like, there's a lot of things that sort of put people on this different playing field that we don't take into consideration, but we just have sort of this end goal of achievement and standards. Okay, okay, that and that cleans that up for me. That that was such a powerful talk. I kind of lost. I had, I used to listen to him twice. But that was a, I had listened to yours three times, and then I had a great mentor at the University of Colorado listen to it. And said, "No, let's talk about it." And it's that's why I said it's such a powerful thing because our youth is what's going to carry us across. I mean, 
and we got to get them up to speed. I want to ask you though about your lunch and learns. You didn't think you didn't know I knew about that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> what are you What are you sharing in those lunch and learn environments? Yeah, so it's uh, an opportunity for us to to just sit down and I work with different organizations and doing this, and we just sort of collaborate and learn. And so it's an opportunity to let's stop and make learning a, a part of our day. And so we, we uh -huh. kind of talk about different things, uh, you know. Some time management is something we want to work out of how do we, we get through this. Another was communication, uh, collaboration. Uh, the, the fan favorite is the diversity, equity, and inclusion right now. Of, yes, uh, yeah. How do we really understand one another and begin to work together uh, with one another and understand that um, when we better understand each other and value each other, then we can work together as a team better. And then our product what we produce as employees actually is better. And so Wait a this minute. thing <laughs> I have just we gotta backtrack on that. When you okay. have diversity and you work better, you know each other better, your product is better. So yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, come on guys. <laughs> <laughs> like I think we all yeah. know this. We we've talked yeah. about teamwork for a very long time, right? Yes, uh, yeah. the the concept of having your team sort of yelling and working together and being able to support each other and being able to bounce ideas off of each other and really collaborate. I think that's always been known to create better. What I'm saying is that in order to do that, you guys have to understand each other better, to value each other as individuals. And then if you really want to take it to the next level is by having different thoughts, different perspectives within that team in order to get you there. So when you have these different perspectives, a different uh, sort of purview of the problem of different solutions, different ways to solve the problem. You're going to be able to find solutions that you may not have even thought of because you have different ideas in the room. And the best way to get that is making sure that these different ideas can learn how to work together, how they can, um, you know, have a constructive disputes with one another yeah, around the yeah. problem. And doing that will help you in turn get to a better solution. I mean, the data is out there. And that's why I don't understand, like, there's a great feel good um, side of diversity, equity, inclusion, but it, at my heart, I'm still a scientist. And so I want to see the numbers and the data and the numbers and the data are there behind diversity. And so why more organizations don't understand that, yes, it's the right thing to do, but not only is it the right thing to do, but from a business standpoint, it's a smart thing to do. And that's where, um, if you, th that's brilliant because the actual lunch and learn starts that process. When people break bread together, they tend to be to get to know each other a little bit better. Thank that's you. brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and that's a little bit of, of where it stems from, uh, where I purposely take time to you know have conversations, to have lunches, coffees with people, just to understand a little bit of who they are and, and where they're from. Um, and it helps us to figure out ways to collaborate that we never even would have thought of if we didn't sit down I understand who you are, you got kids, who your family is, what happened to your mom, how you moved here. And so it begins to help me to better understand you and how to better sort of collaborate with you when it comes to our ideas. Okay, I like that. Tell us real quick about this, the Glad Ed Solutions. Is that how, is this how you've been saying it? How do you say it for, for starters? Sure, yes. So it's Glad Ed Solutions. Um, okay. And the, the name actually comes from my mother, my grandmother, Gladys. Okay. Uh, she always instilled education into the family. She's a matriarch of the family. And so I wanted to, to pay, you know, homage to her and uh, what she did for us as a family. Uh, and so what Gladys Solutions really stemmed from was, um, I remember sort of as a kid, right? Um, going to sleep, hearing my dad come home about nine, 10 o'clock at night, literally every night. Um, really tired, stressed. He left before I even got up in the morning and came back when I was in bed. And he worked very, very hard. And in that time, you know, he came home, you know, didn't want to play because <laughs> he was tired, tired really yeah. disengaged from yeah. the, the environment that he was in and work. And I saw that as I got into my own working environment that, hey, we spend a lot of time at work. Um, we give a lot to our job. And we need our job to be an environment that sort of helps feed into us that help us grow as individuals that really help inspire and engage us so that we can then continue to want to engage with our families 
that we're not drained at the end of the day. And so that's what Glad Ed Solutions does. We train organizations, we coach individuals, we consult, um, we have different training events, uh, whatever is necessary to help work be a better place and just trying to make the world a, a little better. Yeah, and that's very powerful, very powerful indeed. Did you create this uh, the concept or the company before the TEDx or did the TEDx kind of drive that to a new level? So it was a path where the, the TEDx sort of drove the, the company. And so I, I did the TEDx and then I got uh, more into working, you know, with the community and I saw these different working environments and how a lot of people that were in different organizations uh, just kept telling me, you know, I'm not engaged. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I started out loving this. I don't love it anymore. And I need people to want to love what they're doing, enjoy. Like you started out loving it. Why don't you love it anymore? It's not the work. It's not what you're doing. It's the, the environment. And so how do we better shape the environment to keep people engaged to then in turn be able to go back and tell people underneath them that this is worth it? And so right. how do we create the environment that creates this pipeline that continues to have people drive into it. Okay. Um, let me drive us back to the TEDx for a quick second. But before I do that, how do people get a hold of you or your organization? Uh, so, yeah, so there, there are a number of ways. Uh, there's our website, gladedsolutions.com. You Which know, will be I'm in the show notes. On, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn uh, quite often. Uh, you can look for me, Natalie Robinson Bruner or Glad Ed Solutions. Uh, you can even, you know, give me a call, 505-610-8399, and I will answer. Uh, so whatever way you want to get and reach out to me, I'm, I'm available. Okay, cool. Driving you back to the TEDx for a second. I find this to be a unique question. If someone asked me this, I'd have been confused. But how did this TEDx change your life and or your business? So, um, you know what it did? it let me know that um, the ideas I had had value. Like I had always had ideas. Um, you know, I remember sitting in a meeting and, you know, everyone's coming up with the same idea and my idea wasn't like everyone else's. And so I thought, man, I just don't know how to think like them, right? And what the TEDx really did was let me know, hey, we need these different kind of ideas, you know, your ideas have value. It really gave me the sort of the, the confidence I needed to understand that, hey, you can move forward and being the thought leader that you've been in your space on a larger sort of scale. And so mm. I appreciate them for opening up that opportunity to let me know that, hey, continue forward. We believe in you. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and believe in yourself to, to move and advance further than you've been sort of thought of for yourself. Great, great, great. Now, I want to be respectful of your time. I know I, we went started late and we're gone longer than what we said we would, but there's just so much power in this. And um, we're going to ignore, we got haters in the uh, putting stuff up, but we ignore them because oh. they only hate themselves. So we ignore that. We won't even talk about that anymore. But here's a hard question for you. I think it's a hard question and you may be really mad at me. What question should I have asked you that I did not ask you? What question should I have asked you that I didn't ask you? Yeah, so um, I think the the question that probably should have been asked was about the the potential, like of the, the future. Like I, I talked, and I'll, I'll bring this up from the TEDx talk um, about Sheldon and like what he's done. Like there are stories, there are like so many things that will happen. I'm going to say it will happen when we get this right within the STEM field. There's just so many ways that are going to help us to, to move forward and to, to advance as a society together, right? We're not talking about just one group over another group. Like we need everybody working together to help us move forward. It's not going to be just one group. And that's what I think a lot of people don't understand is that we need everybody to move forward together. You're not going to just move ahead one, one group of society yeah, yeah. and us all move together in advance. It needs to be us all moving together. And when that happens, um, it will be a, a beautiful day that I think a lot of people don't even, can't even comprehend when we get there. Okay. Um, a question popped up as soon as you said Sheldon. 
first question is that your james that you refer to that's a different or, person no that's yeah. a different person <laughs> but uh, um the, the one who's children what what are you referring to there so um he he was a student that uh was in our um our graduate program our stem graduate program who was struggling um you know we worked together he graduated went on to lead uh, a, a research team that is basically developing uh, something similar, a vaccine for Ebola, yes. so that um, yeah, so that people won't get Ebola anymore, um, which you all know is a, a very horrible disease. Um, mm -hmm. And so he is very close, and they have gotten it down to a very high percentage. I'm not going to go into it because I haven't read his paper on it yet, um, mm -hmm. but that is the, the work that he's done. And so when we bring, again, different thoughts into the field, we get solutions that we may not have even known of that existed before in the in the in the future. So we, I'm just excited. All right, I'm ex so excited. We had a chance to do this to talk a little bit about it. And one thing I want to toss out because we were waiting for you to get there. I mentioned to everybody that you know we do have this the podcast, and then we do have our discussion with TEDx speakers. They're two different things. Mm -hmm. The ideal of you being able to share in detail should not stop people from going to go look at your TEDx because there's the passion there that people should go, go look at. So I'll just put uh, let this slide across the screen for a couple quick seconds so everybody can see it down there. And we'll put the, the title back up. So you can always find it by the title or find it by the URL going across the bottom of the screen. Powerful talk, opened up a lot of eyes. Um, and I think just because you're so practical about it, you know, said, here's the facts. Here's the, the solution. I think the lunch and learn, I don't know if that wasn't the, you weren't doing that maybe at the time of the TEDx, but I think that's a really powerful concept. I think it's a brilliant concept that you had going there. So the I want to thank you very much for taking the time the and being Let's patient with me twice, three times. But I thank you very much for that. Um, any last comments, statements, any thoughts? No, uh, Glenn, just thank you for, for reaching out and, um, invited me on, onto your platform and for anybody that's listening, you know, take the time, mentor, even if you're not in STEM, whatever you're in, talk to somebody younger than you, talk to somebody on the, the next level, you know, create this mentoring chain, get your own mentor, right? Have someone that's mm -hmm. above you, talk to you, like, let's really sort of work together to advance whatever field you're in. Um, and one more quick comment uh, from, from Jeff, who was asking about how hard is it to go get people to, on a tour of the colleges? He's, he's going to go to the school right away and the high school and just find out what it takes. So in September, he can take some people back up to the university and have them tour. So, awesome. so that's good. That's powerful. Absolutely powerful. Thank you very much. I will go ahead and let us pop off the air here for you so you can get back to work. But hold on for me just a quick second while we okay. sign off. Okay. All right. Thank you for connecting with us here at Touchstone Publishers. Please join our group Essential Leadership Skills and share your leadership knowledge with us all.